faithfulness, but his faithfulness. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then. the road seems hard. The sufferings of this life don't even compare to the glory that not just awaits us in heaven, but is available to us right now. Available to us when? Right now. Because the Bible says that now faith is. Now faith is. And God, we thank you for being a now God. We thank you for being a now God. That you're moving, touching, healing, flowing in this place. We worship you. We bless you, Jesus. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. Come on, sing it with us. How great is our God. Come on, sing with me. How great is 
shared this with the worship team, and I thought it was just for them, but maybe I'm supposed to share it here. Uh, see, I, I sing about how great God is, and, and I, I was having a moment during sound check to this song. This song's probably 20 years old, and you're probably tired of hearing it, but I remember 18 years ago on a Friday night, I think sometime around de de December, the keyboard used to set right here. And J.D. and Nicole were our associate worship leaders. Russ was our worship leader. And I was a 22-year-old with a dream. And Judah Stewart made his appearance the night we were supposed to have a night of worship. I think it may have even been the night you all were ordained. I was on the platform. That one of those rain services. I, that's how long we've been together. We, God was knitting our hearts before we ever knew each other. I was standing up here when they got ordained down here. But that night I stood over there and I got asked to cover for JD on the piano. And one of the songs that night was How Great Is Our God. And my word tonight is keep dreaming. Because the dreams you dream today may be the reality that you live in tomorrow. Or even beyond that. If you'd have told me I'd have been, I just wanted a shot to lead worship at Maranatha. And now I get paid to do it on a weekly basis. And I sat back and go, if you'd have told that 22 year old right there. That that's what it would be. So my, tonight be encouraged and keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. Those God-given dreams, Lord, I pray that life would be, a, would be breathed back in to God 
God-given dreams that the enemy has tried to abort because he's got a plan for those. And if you receive that, just say amen. If you don't, that's okay. But give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Tell him you're glad you're here. Tell your neighbor you're glad that they came. Come on, welcome your neighbor. It's okay. I'll do announcements here. Pastor Lane, if you're watching, I tried to print them off. I, I really did. I fought the printer today, so I did, the, I, I did, the, I did my best, and it, it just wasn't happening. Uh, so, so announcements you, So you, you, you fought the printer, and the printer won? The, the printer did win. The <laughs> printer, Reminds the me of an old won. song, but we won't go there. Hey, one, can we welcome our pastor and first lady home? Ah, good to be hey. home. Yeah, good to be home. it's good to be home. So I'll pull that back afterwards. One, get the messenger, download the messenger, ask someone for help, download the app. Every announcement that you need and the calendar to what's going on in this place is uh, on there. Uh, but don't forget, say, tell your neighbor, don't forget. Sunday after hey, don't service, forget. don't forget. Sunday after service, Sunday after service, there is a hot dog. Hot dog. Sale. And listen, hot dogs. It's listen. It's donation only, and it's a drive-by. It's a pick up and grab and go, not a sit and stay. Okay. It's a drive-by, drive-by hot dog dinner. Yeah. Drive-by. Oh, hot we dog need to dinner. specify. That's right. You know, drive-by. Drive you know. Yeah, that is true. That is you true. know, we've been in some city. Yeah. Anyway, plead but, the blood. Uh, plead the blood. But yeah, we've got that is help send our kids to youth camp. That's, oh, that's is that what it's for? It's for, for youth, youth camp. camp. It's the, it, don't forget the twenty or the the twenty twenty four challenge. Give the missions. And give the three sixteen. The three sixteen challenge. If you've been doing that, uh, we've got a few more weeks left of that. Welcome hey, our I, I tell you, I tell you what. I tell you how we can get rid of the twenty twenty challenge or twenty twenty four challenge and the uh, three sixteen challenge, and that's just everybody start tithing. True. And if uh, that would just yes. that would just do it. Yeah. But anyway. And, but and until is, then. My heart will go on. So I got a song called Until Then, but we won't go into that. But I am thankful. Pastor, it's good to have you home. It's good to be home, Joey. And we are blessed and we are excited. So get your Bible out and be ready to receive yep. what our pastor has. Praise the Lord. Well, we, we pray that it's, it's what the Lord wants. And Joey, I was just having a conversation with Jay. If you love what you're doing so much, you can do it for free. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I just was, but... I am reminded you have done it for free. That's why you, you know. I, and I was just, I was just really playing in that. That's not pick on the staff all the time. It, you got to have thick skin to be on this staff, and and uh, and we enjoy picking on each other and loving one another. And um, thank you, Joey. It's good to be home. I missed all of you. Um, I know, I know, I don't know all of you, but I recognize most all of your faces, and and I missed you while I was gone. Two weeks is a long, two Sundays, two Wednesdays is a long time, and then I come back, and I'm reminded that Benny Matthews from Alpha Ministry is supposed to be here Sunday morning to preach, and I'm thinking, man, I don't even get to preach on Sunday morning, but don't let, make sure you come out uh, and listen to Benny. Benny is a phenomenal, he is uh, one of the missionaries that we support. Uh, support in India, and he is a phenomenal man. He's a great speaker, so make sure you come out uh, Sunday. Tell your neighbor, come out Sunday for Benny Matthews from Alpha Ministry, and I'm going to go ahead and jump in the Word if I can, if that's all right. I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to do it. I want to talk to you this evening about spiritual warfare. I I, I consulted the Lord uh, while I was away uh, and um, and. Um, trying to figure out what I'm supposed to speak on when I get back. And uh, I, I sensed that it was spiritual warfare. But this isn't a step-by-step uh, 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 -step deal of, um, of what spiritual warfare is and so on and so forth. This is really why there is spiritual warfare. And there's three things I need you to remember about this message. Spiritual warfare is about it's about territory, identity, and authority. 
That's what spiritual warfare boils down to. It doesn't, man, I just feel in the Holy Ghost there. It doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter how you got in it. It doesn't matter uh, what weapons this and that. It boils down to it has to do with territory. We are all called to a territory. It has to do with the territory that you're called to possess for the kingdom of God. It has to do with who you are in Jesus Christ, and it has to do with authority. If you don't know who you are in Jesus Christ, then it, you will not have authority because your identity, authority is dependent upon identity, and you cannot possess anything for the King of kings and the Lord of lords unless you have your identity and your authority, then you can possess a territory. That's basically the message in a nutshell, but we're going to take a long version. Amen? Thank you for being so kind. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, New Living Translation, in this way, he, he meaning Jesus, disarmed spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them in the car, in, on the cross. In this way, what does that mean? What way? The way that Jesus was nailed to the cross. That's all you really need to know. In this way, in this way, in Jesus being nailed to the cross, he what? He disarmed spiritual rulers and authority. By Jesus being nailed to the cross, purchased our salvation, made a way for us to get to heaven, but he also disarmed satanic devices. I don't care what satanic devices, I don't care what weapons formed, I, I don't care what principalities in action, I don't care what area you're in, Jesus disarmed it all by his work on the cross. Now, it doesn't mean that certain places, uh, uh, territories are not possessed by the devil, it just means it is not possessed for the kingdom of God yet. So therefore, if it is not possessed for the kingdom, the enemy has leeway to it. We all together. Now, I personally do not believe a Christian, if they're truly saved, can be possessed by the devil. But I do believe that the enemy can use antics against Christians. Went a little far there, but anyway. In this way, he disarmed. Disarmed means he took away the weapons and rendered him harmless. Remember a couple weeks ago, this goes in line with the message I preached, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, about five weapons that Jesus used to defeat Satan. And one of them was that, that he rendered Satan harmless by his work on the cross, that, that Satan is no more than a buzzing bumblebee without a stinger. And he just goes around buzzing real loud trying to inflict fear. Jesus already went, rendered him harmless because he took every weapon away that he could possibly use. He's just trying to get you to buy into his deception. Are we? Y'all there with me? You awake? Listen, I got good news for you. This is Wednesday. It is all downhill from here till the weekend, okay? So the hard part's over. You can already start the party, okay? You can already start it. Satan is disarmed. That's all you need to know right now. You can start the party. Amen? He disarmed spiritual rulers and authorities. That's all demonic forces. Christians, this is good to know, Christians are not called to defeat Satan. Jesus already did that. Your responsibility from James 4, verse 7, I'm not going to go to it for sake of time, but your responsibility is to submit yourself to God, James 4, 7, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. So, submit yourself to God means that you're going to give yourself under the authority of God. And resist the devil means you're going to enforce his defeat. How do we enforce his defeat? How do we enforce Satan's defeat? One, water baptism. After you're saved, water baptism. Someone asked me the other day, said, I heard you preach that you don't believe that uh, you have to be baptized to make it to heaven. No, I don't, because I think some people die before they have an opportunity to get baptized. But I will say this, if you have the opportunity to be baptized, you have to be baptized. I'm just trying to encourage you, if you have been baptized, you need to get baptized. 
That's a weapon because it is a picture. It, it is an outward picture of what Jesus did for us spiritually on the inside. Can I get an amen? So we do that one. We enforce his defeat by baptism, water baptism, also by spiritual baptism. But I'm talking about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Boy, I thought you'd come alive on that one. Pentecost, I missed Pentecost while I was going. I, so we come against the enemy. We enforce uh, the defeat of Satan by uh, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, by praying, by praying in the Spirit, by using spiritual gifts, by obeying the Word of God. Tell your neighbor you really need to obey the Word of God. You can't just come into a church, hear a message, and say, man, that's awesome. You need to obey the Word of God day in, day out. It doesn't matter what happened. You can't make excuses. You can't use it to do what you... Obey the Word of God. If it's in the book, then you do it. If it isn't in the book, then you don't do it. So we enforce Satan's defeat by obeying the Word of God. We enforce Satan's defeat by loving one another. <laughs> look at your neighbor say, you have to love me whether you want to or not. Maybe you can look across the sanctuary and tell somebody across, because I know how it is. I know how churches play the games. I'm not sitting over there anymore. They tick me off. Well, I'm here just to help you to get unticked, and you need to let it go. Elsa, you need to just let it go. Let it. I won't sing it, but you just need to let it go and learn how to love one another. When, listen, when you love one another, Satan hates it. So just go ahead and love them anyway, amen? And you enforce it, you enforce Satan's defeat by the blood of Jesus. Listen, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over everything. I plead the blood of Jesus over the food I eat. I plead the blood of Jesus over the car I'm driving, over the trip I'm on, over my children, over my grandchildren, over this church. I plead the blood of Jesus over you, whether you want to pull that up. I plead it anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it. But we Christians can become preoccupied with battling Satan. As though we make it our ministry. And I'm sorry, Satan's already defeated. You don't need a ministry on defeating Satan. Oh, I can just, I got to stay on task, stay on task. He's already defeated. So you don't need to come up with a ministry on how to defeat Satan. He's already under our feet. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we invest too much time and energy attempting to do what Christ already did on the cross. Tell your neighbor, I don't know if you know it or not. Come on, tell your neighbor, I don't know if you know it or not, but Satan's already defeated. Oh, can I go further? Thank you. Tell your neighbor, you need to stop crying. You need to stop whining. You need to stop belly aching because you've already won. You cut a limb off of a tree, it's still green. It's already dead. It just doesn't know it yet. My God. Satan, man, he, he, he will try to act like he's alive and intimidated and keep you in the boo-hoo and the wallowing in your mud. and Oh, it's so bad. It's going to get worse. Shut your mouth. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You've already won. You just need to start declaring it. Go through Walmart. I'm a winner. Go through Kroger. I'm a winner. DMV, I'm a winner. When your number hadn't been called yet, I'm a winner. He's crazy, no. He just goes down there to that Maranatha. Why? Well, I don't care. You need to start telling yourself that you're the winner. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out in the city and in the field. I am the lender and not the borrower in Jesus' name. I've already won. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. It doesn't matter the hell you walk through. It doesn't matter how many enemies you got lined up. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And because of that, I'm the winner. You know, you need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself. 
you prune sucking thing. You need to get your son. Oh, I'm going, man, this is nice. It's all free. You've been sucking on that prune too long. Your life is not that bad. Let me say that again. You prune sucking thing. You need to lay the prunes and the lemons down and tell yourself, my life is not that bad. I meet people, I meet people sometimes, and it's always gloom and doom. And then they wonder why I cross the other side of the sanctuary. Well, see, well, I just told you. <laughs> Time to lay the lemon down. I've always got a problem. That's the problem. Let me ask you a question. Are you still breathing? Did you eat today? Do you got clothes on your back? You got shoes on your feet? Do you realize there are people who buried their loved one today that would do anything to have your problem? Let me move on. Let me move on. Don't get preoccupied with battling Satan. He's already defeated. And just for sake of getting it done, tell your neighbor, put the prune away. Prunes, are they sour? Not really. They're sweet. Well, I was told they make you go to the bathroom pretty good, but put the prune away and lay the lemon down. Terry, is that why you was laughing about the prune? Because he's eating it. And he's, I don't even know. But I am serious. You know, last night I went to I went to our oldest grandson's graduate kindergarten graduation, and um, and 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 something hit me while I was there. I watched these little kids. They all dressed. They all dressed the part that they wanted to be when they grew up. And and uh, our our grandchildren. Uh, uh, they go to, to, to a Christian school, and everybody has their own thoughts on that, and just, you do you, and don't worry about it. And uh, I can just say for my grandkids, it, and for Joey's kids, it has been a great thing. My, my granddaughter, my granddaughter struggled so bad in public school. My granddaughter is, is, struggles with dyslexia just like her daddy and her granddad. And, and she got in private school, and she got that determination in action. And I'm telling you, she is soaring unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. But anyhow, I went to this graduate, and our problem, you know what our problem is, Jay? We stop being kids. Somewhere along the way, we stop being kids. I'm not saying be childish. I'm saying being childlike. We stop dreaming. We stop thinking about what we could be. We stop dreaming. My, my grandson, when he gets up there, my grandson, he hardly ever smiles. Uh, uh, Lincoln, he, uh, he was in the, uh, we tried to get him to be in the, um, the journey, and uh, what was it that Alyssa told him? Yeah, he, he, we, you know, we're all about passion and excitement, and Joey says that if you're not uh, doing it to where you feel embarrassed, you're not doing it hard enough, and, and, and they were trying to get Lincoln to, to be excited, and, and Alyssa, his mom, said, you need to be more excitable, and he said, Mom, I'm just not an excited person. <laughs> with a straight face, he just, he, and he, he isn't. He isn't, and he gets up there with his little white coat on and his little glasses is too big for his head. And, and he gets up there, and he said, my, my name is Lincoln James Powell. I'm six years old, and when I grow up, I want to be a scientist. And he, went, and he went on, and I'm like, we stopped being kids. We stopped having faith like kids. We, oh my God, we, we have forgotten what it's like to be a son or a daughter because we grew up. We grew up and we become moms and dads and that's okay, but we can never outgrow being a son or daughter. Let me get back to the message. <coughs> I want to read, let's see where I'm at. 
I want to I, I want to try to draw you a picture. I've got 20 minutes or so left. I want to try to draw you a picture. I know some of you think I should already be done by now, but we got Joey cut worship short, I guess. Bless your heart, Joey. I want to read you a picture. Uh, oh, my, I skipped over that. Oh, I did. Oh, wow. Well, that's too bad. Um, I want you to turn to uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Now, you pray for this dyslexic as I begin to read 20 verses to you. And in this picture, in this text, I want you to see a picture of a broken man and a picture of spiritual warfare. This is about the demoniac, remember? Remember how Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. I'm going to pick up in verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him one out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. In other words, there was a demon-possessed man that came out of the cemetery. Are you with me? Came out of the tombs, uh, uh, came from out of the tombs, and the man uh, with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because they had often uh, been bound, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When, they saw, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? He said, I implore you that you, by God, that you would not torment me. Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Get a hold of verse 10. Also, this is the demon. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Do whatever you want to with us, but don't send us out of the territory. This territory is our influence. This is the demon speaking. This territory is our influence. This is where we have influence. This is where we know all the people. This is where we know their shortcomings. This is where we know their strong points, their weaknesses. Do not send us out of the territory. Now, the lar now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. At once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So that those who fed the swine, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. When they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, that he who had the legion, he was sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. And those who saw it told how it had happened to him, and how it, that he who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Now get this. <clears throat> then the people who saw it and told about it, they all looked at Jesus and they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got in the boat, Jesus will not stay where he is not wanted. If you don't want Jesus around, he won't stay around. But if you want him to draw near, he'll draw near. And when he got into the boat, meaning Jesus, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might go with him. However, Jesus did not permit him but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you 
and how he has had compassion on me. And he departed and to begin to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Now in these 20 verses, we see a broken man and a picture of genuine spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is a battle for territory, identity, and authority. Territory. The struggle, the fight in this demoniac was about the territory that he was called to impact for the kingdom of God. Pastor, you just said he was demon-possessed. Yes, I did. But you said he was called to impact that region for the kingdom of God. That's right. Just because someone is demon-possessed doesn't mean they don't have a calling on them. Just because your son or daughter is is, is caught up in an alternative lifestyle does not mean that God does not have a calling and a territory for them. Just because someone is strung out on drugs or alcohol or pornography or food or sugar or, or anything else, it means nothing because God has a calling upon their life and he has a territory for them to impact This, this was about the territory. It was not about this man. And it was not about the pigs. It was about the territory. The devil was trying to keep this man bound. He was trying to keep him possessed, trying to keep him confused or addicted or depressed because of what was really on the inside of him. Because what was really on the inside of this demoniac was transformation of a territory. A territory that he was called to. We see people who's all jacked up and we write them off. And what we fail to realize is they may have a calling upon them on the territory that our sons and daughters may be addicted in. It's amazing how we'll j- how quickly we'll just give up on somebody. Because they had a oops, a slip up, a screw up, a hang up. Boy, I'm glad we've never had those. How about you? The only difference is maybe we was able to keep ours quiet or silent and somebody. It's no different. But it all comes down to the territory. And the devil was trying to keep him in such a place to keep transformation of a territory trying to take place. It was not about this one man. It was about the thousands that he was going to impact for the kingdom of God. You got to get a hold of this. If you read this text, you'll, you'll, find, you'll find this man in, in, in the Gadarenes, and he's called to, to uh, um, I started to say Gal Polis. It isn't Gal Polis. It's, it, it, it's what? It's the Kappa. Yeah. You liked that, didn't you, honey? Yeah. He was called to Decapolis. It was a 10-region city, but he was one man. He, he was a fouled up, jacked up, messed up demoniac with, with, who, who cut himself, who, who, was, who was probably anorexic and bulimic and cutting himself in the stones and cutting himself and hanging out in the graveyard. He was self-mutilating, and people wrote him off. And when, they, when people who used to see him all jacked up saw him in his right mind, they was afraid of him. My God, what's the matter with that? Shows us just how messed up the world really is. You you know why people, you know why the world puts down the church so bad? It's because they don't know how to explain how somebody can be so messed up, jacked up, and turned around and set straight. They don't know how that works because they don't know the God that we serve. Somebody shout to God right there. So in verse 10, Jesus stands in front of this demoniac. And he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So Legion's facing Jesus, and he says, don't send us out of the country. We want to stay in the territory. And I told you why. 
Because the enemy, when it says that he seeks whom he may devour, I can't quote the scripture at this moment, but the scripture says that he seeks who he may devour. That means that the enemy studies who he may devour. Because you see, he had, oh, this is good. See, he has to study you because he doesn't have the authority to overtake you. I hadn't seen that before. He doesn't have the authority to overtake you, so he studies you to find out where you're weak so he knows how to hit you. He knows where to grasp you. He knows who to send your way. If you got, if, if, oh, my God, if, 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 you got a, if you got a weakness for drugs, then he's going to send drugs your way to try to get you distracted. If, if, if a short skirt's your problem, then, then he's going to send short skirts your way to try to get you distracted. He studies you to find out because he doesn't have the authority to just outright overtake you. So these demons are in this territory. What have they been doing? They've been studying. They've been studying the people as they walk by the cemetery. And, and, and as he, this demoniac's just wandering around, cutting himself, these demons are studying so that he, they don't want to be cast out of the territory because they're familiar with it. This is why you can't take vacation at home. You miss that. You can't take vacation at home because the demons are familiar with you there. You need to get out of your territory where the demons are familiar with you so you can rest and recoup and rejuvenate and get God back. Well, that's free. Oh, I found some thumbprint cookies while I was there, too. I didn't just find God while I found some. Anyhow. <laughs> So he's fine. They said, just don't send us out of the territory. Listen, everyone and every territory is filled with something, good or bad, godly or evil. The problem comes in is when we label people as evil. I, listen. I don't believe people are evil. I believe people have some evil habits. I believe they've had some things done to them that maybe we haven't, and it's formed certain tendencies and things. But I believe that God can set anybody free. So everybody in every place is filled with something good or bad, light or dark. Amen? Amen, Pastor. That's a good word. It's either godly or ungodly. And if Satan finds someone or some place that's empty, he'll possess it. I remind you of scripture, I'm not going to read it for sake of time, Luke 11, 24 through 26. It says, when an evil spirit comes and finds a house that's empty, it's swept and clean and empty, he enters in to take possession of it. And not just he himself, but he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than him. And it says the last state of the person is worse than the first. See, you can clean your house. I'm going to go ahead. You can come to church. You can sing. You can dance. You can worship. You can serve. It means nothing unless Jesus is the possessor of your house. If he is not the possessor of your house, then we wonder why the devil does this. And does. He's got free access. Why? Because it's empty. Mm. Here's something else. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. Never make a battle personal. Don't ever put a face on an enemy. Oh, here's a, here, this, is, this is free too. Not only can you not put a face on an enemy, you can't put a face on someone who corrects you. Oh. Because many times we look at both of them the same way. And it says in God's word that the father will correct his children. So if you have someone that loves you and wants to see the best in you and they try to, it'll hurt like the dickens, but it's worth it. 
And you better thank God for someone who sees enough inside of you that's willing to sit you down and split you wide open and say, come on now, let's get this together. You better thank God for people like that. Hurts? How many of you ever got this week? I heard that you, you talk like that one more time, you're going to go to your room. Well, go to my room? You realize what's in my room? I got toys. Well, I had toys. They games and stuff. Now, how many of you ever got whipped when you was a kid? I mean, wh- whooped. You know? It hurts. But I got to be honest with you. I'm pretty thankful for those whoopings now because those whoopings taught me, you best not lie to me, boy. <laughs> those whoopings taught me, you better watch your mouth. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that alone. You know what I'm talking about. So you better thank God when somebody loves you enough and sees enough inside of you to sit you down and say, hey, we got to work on this. All right, that's right. It wasn't about the man. It was about the territory that, he was, that was assigned to him. Your territory. I want, I, want, I want to touch on this right here real quick. <coughs> Forgive me. I haven't preached in two weeks and my voice is wearing thin. I know that all of you in here tonight, you look at people around you and you can see their territory. But some of you are struggling to see your own territory. Part of the territory that I know that I'm called to impact for the kingdom of God is St. Albans. Thank you, Lord. I hadn't said that in a while. See, you got to keep things like that in front of you because sometimes you'll forget about them and you won't do anything to make sure that you're about... God's business in that. So the Holy Spirit just reminded me in front of all you that part of my territory is St. Albans. And I must leave it better than I found it. Nothing against anybody, but that's just part of it. And I, God help me, I'll leave that alone. So some of you will look at it and say, oh yeah, he's called to St. Albans. Yeah, bro, what am I called? It doesn't matter the size of your territory. Have pastors, go pick it up, Johnny. Have pastors all the time, how big's your church? It doesn't matter how big the church is. Oh, you're used to preaching this many. It, ma- it matters not how many you preach to. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean nothing. Everybody's caught up in size. Everybody's caught up in how many. How many did you see saved last year? How many did you baptize? It, That's why, are we being faithful? Well, we've been faithful with what we have. If we're not, then why would God add to it? It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter how big or how large. It doesn't matter the size of the territory. Are we being faithful with, with, with the territory that God has entrusted to us? So your territory, your home, your family, your job, your mission field. Wait a minute. I'm not called to Africa. I didn't say that. But how many of you have kids? How many of your kids plays a sport? Guess what? Those of you who, who have kids and they play a sport, I want you to stand up. All right now, come on, stand up. We'll pretend we're in a Catholic church. Just stand up here. Guess where your mission field is? On that baseball field, that football field, that softball field, where at that whatever field. I got put down all the time when you, you can be seated. When, when, when we were in Enterprise, uh, uh, all, all of our kids uh, played ball. We were, to, we were to field all the time. And, and, and I got tired of, of going to the baseball field until I realized, wait a minute, this is my mission field. And when I realized that that was my territory, by God's grace, the devil paid greatly. Because when I realized that was my mission field, we started talking to moms and dads that our boys played baseball with. 
we befriended them. We got to talk to them. We eventually invited them to church. They came to church. Some of them ended up getting saved. Some of them went on a 40-day fast. I thought they was going to kill their spouse, but they made it. <laughs> Use it as a mission field. I, 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 I Listen. <laughs> We have grandkids that plays all kinds of sports. It seems like in the summertime, all we do, and, and I even had a conversation with my wife. I said, listen, we're not running to Sissonville every night of the week. <laughs> because I don't know if you all's price gas lately or not. And I said, we're not running to Sissonville every night of the week. It was Vander and Lincoln and Sailor. They're all playing. Gwenny's playing down in... Uh, Winfield, uh, and you know, we're just here and there, and that's really the only time I was thankful that, that Piper and Leo are up in Minnesota, because, you know, that's just, wow, I mean, six, man, that's just rough, so we're all time, and I told her we're not running Winfield every night, but doggone, we, it seemed like we were in Winfield, or up in Sissonville almost every night of the week, and we complain about that, but what if that's a territory that we're called to, anyway, your territory, your job, your family, your neighborhood, your city, your church. There's a territory that's assigned to every one of us. And it isn't how large the territory, but it's always being faithful who God's already entrusted to us. Joey, I'm almost finished, I think. Yeah. We'll act like it. Identity and authority, real quick. Mark 5, verse 15. Honey, is this all right? Verse 15. Then they came to Jesus. Oh, yeah, this is great. And saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting in clothes and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Your identity comes from who you are in Jesus Christ. Your identity is not based on your past. It's not based on what you've done. It doesn't, isn't based on your last name. It, 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 it's not... Your identity is not what you do for a living. It's not who your family is. But it's are you a son or a daughter of Almighty God? Do you know him as your Savior? I, I'm not, I didn't ask you if you came to church. I didn't ask you if you put something in the offering. Well, don't play yet. We're not that, far, we're not that close. <clears throat> I just want you to make me look good, Joey. I didn't ask you if you volunteer somewhere in church. I ask you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? This will blow your mind. On any given Sunday, it has been proven that 50 to 51% of the congregation is lost. And, and these are people that we will see week after week after week. And this is what I'll tell you. You keep coming week after week after week, and I'm going to keep proclaiming the word of God and the blood of Jesus, and, and I'm going to give you an invitation to get saved. And one day the Holy Ghost is going to settle down on you like a hen sets down on her biddies, and you're not going to be able to take it, and you're going to run to an altar. And somebody said, I thought they were already saved. Well, you thought they were, but God knew they wasn't, and God didn't get tired of reaching out. Right. Wow. So your identity is based on who you are in Jesus, not what you do for a living. But as long as this demoniac's identity was in question, the territory could not be affected. You see, identity carries the authority. And your authority determines how far you go in your territory. Who has authority? Matthew 28, 18, and 20. I read this a few weeks ago. And Jesus came and spoke to them, meaning his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Luke 19, 10, behold, I give you, tell your neighbor, he's talking to you here. Jesus said, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Listen, 
The devil lives in constant fear of you discovering your true identity. thinking of a name and I, and I can't I can't uh, we baptized her and you made fun of me for asking Edna Edna I know Ed, Edna as well as I know my own name I just couldn't Edna am I free to speak as long as the devil could keep you confused imprisoned behind bars Messed up in an alternative lifestyle. He was all right, but he lived in constant fear of you truly beginning to understand who you are. And once you came in contact with the blood of Jesus, he knew that his task, he knew that his hold on you was limited in time. And now, because he that is in you is greater than he that's in the world, he set you free. He loosed the cords that bound you. He didn't just take you out of the walls. He didn't just break the cords or the chains, but he brought you into your right mind. He canceled the, the records of wrong against you by hanging on the cross. He said, you are not confused. You are not messed up in an alternative lifestyle, but you are my daughter. You are whole. You are well. You are healed. You are saved. You are delivered in Jesus' name. That's what God, that's what God can do. We need my God, we need to have testimonies like that out in the world. We need to have testimonies who was caught up in an alternative lifestyle and say, yes, I was messed up, I was jacked up, but let me tell you what the blood of Jesus set me free of. We need people who's addicted to drugs and pornography and alcohol to let somebody know greater is he that lives in here than he who had me bound. The world wouldn't know what to do. The world doesn't know what to do with that Gooch, and 90% of the church doesn't know either. Because the world and 90% of the church is afraid of people like Edna Gooch. My God, that's a truth right there. They're afraid of a testimony like that. Go ahead, Edna. I was in a prison right in that church. God sent some angels to me. One of my sisters was in for a murder. Well, but God, she taught me about spiritual warfare. I used to use crystals. Taught me how to study the Bible, how to read and how to pray. But on June the 10th, I was walking wholeheartedly with the Lord. I give them all the glory. Yeah. All the honor. Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. Give God praise. Hey. Yeah, oh, hey. Hey, this is going to hurt. Tell your neighbor, it's going to hurt. But there's some of you sitting right now, you got a son or daughter jacked up in, a, in an alternative lifestyle. You got them out there doing God only knows what, and you're sitting there like a, like a lemon eater, like I ain't going to do anything because they ain't touched my daughter. If you don't know, if you can't learn how to celebrate with somebody who God already set free, then why would God deliver Until we learn to celebrate with others in their victories, why would God give us our victory? Oh, I got to stop. I'm going to preach myself stupid. It's the truth. Damn, my son died. Well, prune face. I don't care. I believe her sour. 
Prune face, you need to get over yourself. Yeah, there it is. This demoniac goes to Jesus and he said, hey, he said, I don't want to stay here with these fools. He said, I finally got delivered. I finally got set free. I'm in my right mind. I finally got clothes on for the first time in 15 years. And I learned I can sit down at the master's feet and be at peace. And, they, and they're, they're afraid of me. I don't want to stay here. Jesus, can I go with you? He said, no. No, he said, you go home. You go home to your friends and your family. And you tell them. What great things I've done for you. You tell them how I've had mercy on you. You tell them how I set you free from an alternative lifestyle. You go tell them how I took drugs out of your vocabulary. You go tell them how I stripped you down of pornography. You go tell them how alcohol once bound you, but now you're free. You tell them how you were blind to everything and oblivious, but now you have your mind right. You go tell them, and each time you tell them, you read live the power of Jesus setting you free. You know what's happened? We've stopped telling people. We've stopped telling people that I'm called to impact the city of St. Albans. We stopped telling people how God set us free from lesbianism. Why? Because of what people might think about me. I hate to tell you. I hate to tell you. They're thinking about it. They're thinking it about you anyway. They're just not saying it in front of your face. They don't know what to do with Edna Gooch. I told you 90% of the church don't know what to do with Edna Gooch. Why? Because God delivered her of lesbianism. And she's waiting on her husband, she said. <laughs> And, and, the, and, the, and the church and the church is afraid of that because my God don't get that out there other people might be contaminated with it too you're doggone right they're contaminated but thank God we've got somebody who knows the cure to it and when somebody inside God's house knows the cure it's not afraid of telling what God delivered them from. Then others who's, I'm sorry, contaminated, knows they can be set free. World doesn't know what to do with Kenny. And half of you just treat him nice because he's so big. He crushed you like an ant. Got people ask me all the, who's that big black guy? I said, oh, Kenny. <laughs> Church doesn't know what to do with you. But I'm thankful that when you hit that door, God showed me what to do with you. Hey, brother, I love you. I love you like nobody's business. And God showed me your heart from day one. He showed me the confusion. He showed me the hurt. He showed me the pain. He showed me all of it. And he said, Darren, you do what I taught you to do. You love him right where he is. Because God's placed the love inside of my heart to love some messed up, jacked up people right where they are. Dating a white girl. Church terrified. Oh. Too far in to quit now. God, man, pastor puts his stamp of approval on that. We have black and whites all over the place getting together. I say let them talk. Because this is what I know. God knows what he's doing. 
And God made no mistake when he brought Rachel and he brought Kenny together. And it might not have been in the way that we all would have thought it would have worked out, but God used what the enemy tried to destroy us with. He used it for our good. He brought you together. you got kids in your house that aren't even your flesh and blood. And you're raising them for the kingdom of God and you're making an eternal difference. So don't anybody come wagging their tongue to me. About this don't look right there. Well, save it. Save it for your lemon. I want to see God move. I want to see God raise the dead. I want to see God open blind eyes. I, I, I don't even know where I'm at. But I know it's good. I like it. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm, at a, I'm at an all-you-can-eat buffet dinner lined up with the Holy Ghost. The best thing we can all do tonight is say, yes, God, whatever you want. I'm not even going to apologize if I offended. I didn't offend you. I can't offend you. You're my brother. If I offend you, you get over it. And if you offend me, I get over it. But I don't know why you cut your hair. I like that big fro you had going on. I go away for two weeks. Two weeks, Kenny. I go away for two weeks and you come back bald. Every time I go away, shaved off your dreadlocks, you got rid of those, and I go away another two weeks and now you get rid of your fro. And then pick's even gone. What's up with this? <laughs> having fun you know what you got fed you laughed and you cried tonight I want to encourage you to go tell your story in your territory and you watch as you begin to operate in your identity in your territory under the authority of almighty God you watch what happens I'm not saying you'll see it immediately, although some of you might. But I will say this, when you do it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, year pastor, yes, sometimes. There's some things my wife and I are seeing now. It's taken almost a decade to come to pass. Sometimes a battle gets strong and it's hard and you feel like giving up. But I remember I remember after I had a heart attack I considered laying the ministry down doing something different. I talked it over with all my kids. Two of my kids said, well, Dad, whatever you think is right, whatever you think is best. One of my kids said, Dad, what do you mean lay it down? He said, what do you mean quit, Dad? He said, we don't quit. You know we don't quit. He said, what about all those people in St. Albans, Dad? What about your dream of not hundreds but thousands, Dad? He said, what about all that? You just going to give up on all that? And that son is over in the youth teaching your children tonight. The only thing I'm saying is don't let the battle get too weary to where you think about quitting. Because you'll never see it if you quit. You'll never see it if you give up. You've got children and relatives and <coughs> grandchildren who's watching you. They may call you a fanatic, a freak, a Maranathite, a, a cult, a whatever. They're watching you. 
And one day, one day, they're going to say something out of their mouth that's going to blow you away. And it's because you didn't quit. Tell your neighbor, go tell your story. In your territory. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would take this message tonight and you would use it somehow to advance and benefit your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would touch the sons and daughters under the sound of my voice tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would lead them like never before. I pray that you would deal with their heart, Lord, in ways that they haven't experienced in a month or more. And Father, I pray you'd touch the discouraged tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'd lift their head up. Tell them it's time to keep marching, God. It's not time to pack up. It's not time to give up. It's time to press in. It's time to press on. Tell somebody about how good God's been to you. Tell somebody about how God saved your soul. How he delivered you from death. How he delivered you from what once bound you. Father, I pray that you would use it for your good. And Lord, may you take some of these ex-demoniacs and may you loose them into capless. And Lord, the next time you come back, may, they be, may you find thousands who's heard the gospel waiting to advance your kingdom. I thank you for it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. Everyone stand to your feet if you would. <coughs> If there's anything on your heart tonight that you need to pray for, you come and pray. Some of you just need to come and thank God. I said some of you just need to come and thank God. You need to thank God that he delivered you. You need to thank God you're not still in prison. You need to thank God that he kept you out of prison. You need to thank God you're still alive because some of you shouldn't even still be alive tonight. If he's delivered you from anything or anyone, I want you to come and thank him tonight. And I mean it. If he's delivered you from anything, or if you've been saved so long, you've forgotten what he's delivered you of, once you get around this altar and say, God, remind me one more time. And when he reminds you, you make sure you go tell your story. Go ahead, Joey. Instead, you took my place. Amazing grace. It's more than a song. Even though I don't deserve your love for me, you look beyond my faults. You showed me mercy. So here I am. Father, we thank you for the message that you 
gave us tonight on authority and identity and territory, Lord God. Help it to get into our hearts, Father. We, it helps to explain why we've had some of the battles that we've had. It helps to shine a light on the fact that we need to keep on keeping on. Father, thank you for your scripture that says if we don't grow weary in doing well in due season, we'll reap if we don't quit. So, Father, thank you for helping us to stay the course, to rely on you, that your grace is sufficient. Father, help us to get a realization in our heart and mind that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Thank you, Lord. Get us home safe. Father, we pray that you would go before us tomorrow and prepare the way for us to share our testimony somehow, some way, with someone. And we know you'll bring the increase. <laughs> we thank you, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Praise God. See you Sunday.